In Splinter Cell Conviction, would you believe me if I said that Tom Reed was actually the good guy all along? What's up guys, Acer Foreign here, and welcome to another video game story analysis video. I do these analysis and discussion videos on a regular basis, so if you'd like to see more of them, hit that subscribe button to stay notified. So, after the events of Double Agent, when Lambert dies, Sam Fisher spends a few years wandering around from one place to the next, with no purpose, no rhyme or reason, just existing. Meanwhile, over at Third Echelon, a guy named Tom Reed takes Lambert's place as the director. Now, the story would have you believe that Reed is a corrupt person who plans to twist Third Echelon to suit his own evil ends. The story would have you believe that he is simply attempting to assassinate the president simply so the vice president can take over as president. Reed was promised some lucrative promotions if the vice president was able to actually get inducted as president, and therefore it is even his decision to make in the first place whether Reed gets promoted. Meanwhile, the sitting president, Patricia Cadwell, plans to shut down Third Echelon in an attempt to trim the fat off the government's budget. I mean, the deficit is already high enough as it is. And in an act of sheer hypocrisy, Reed initiates his own terrorist attack in order to show Cadwell that Third Echelon is necessary. Kind of like how an employee may rob his employer's cash register in an attempt to show how valuable of an employee he is. What? Now, if we take the events of Splinter Cell Conviction in a vacuum, that's pretty much all we're told. Without further context, yeah, Reed comes off as just this evil psychopath who has no respect for the rule of law. This story isn't happening in a vacuum, however. As of the time this game was made, there were four main series games and six tie-in novels which contribute to the lore and mythos of this franchise. So today, I'd like to take a look at the grander picture and see if Reed might have some justification to what he's doing. So let's assume that Reed's plan never even got off the ground, let alone was thwarted at the last minute by Sam and Grimm. And so the president goes ahead and shuts down Third Echelon without any opposition. I then have to ask, what happens next? Specifically, what happens to all the splinter cells in Third Echelon's employ? Where are they supposed to go? What are they supposed to do? Now, if this were any ordinary shutdown of a superfluous government agency, the answer would be simple. They would move on to other professions, perhaps re-enter the private sector and get new jobs. However, Third Echelon is no ordinary government agency. Now, you wouldn't know this from the events of Conviction. In that game, Third Echelon has a headquarters that is out in the open, and the front lobby appears to be accessible to the public. The front receptionist desk even has the words Third Echelon in big, bold letters, and the receptionist can even be seen taking a call, presumably from some public citizen. However, this is not how Third Echelon has historically been portrayed. Third Echelon is a top secret agency. Its very existence is heavily denied by the US government, and any credit for any of its achievements is passed on to some random dudes who took no part in resolving the crisis, but are instead just stand-ins for Third Echelon. In the novels, there is a heavy implication that Third Echelon doesn't even have a headquarters at all, since in the rare event, that Fisher and Lambert are required to meet face to face, they usually have to meet in some heavily public place like a food court or a shopping mall. Now, in order to enforce the secrecy and official non-existence of this agency, even the Splinter Cells themselves are similarly non-existent in the eyes of the US government. To ensure that there is no way to trace the actions of the Splinter Cells to the US government and therefore expose the latter, Splinter Cells are subject to something known as Protocol 6. Basically, their entire histories are wiped from the record books in almost every conceivable way. This is honestly some Orwellian shit right here, where any records of the past that don't fit the inner party's present agendas are found and incinerated in a memory hole. 
The only thing that prevents Protocol 6 from being a completely unacceptable and morally abominable practice is the fact that the Splinter Cells have all consented to having their histories and identities erased. To give you just a sample of how far-reaching Protocol 6 is, let's turn to the tie-in novels. In the second book in that series, Operation Barracuda, Fisher hooks up with Cadia, his Krav Maga instructor. Now, this is actually forbidden for a Splinter Cell to do. They tolerate his relationship with his daughter Sarah, as he already had her when he joined Third Echelon, but he is forbidden from forging any new relationships. Fisher is reminded later in that same book why he cannot have girlfriends when Cadia is killed by a sniper bullet that was meant for him. Now, I bring that up to say this. For a brief time during his relationship with Cadia, Fisher contemplates resigning from Third Echelon and living a normal life with her. However, he puts the kibosh on that idea almost as soon as it gets brought up, because he knows it wouldn't work. When he signed up to be a Splinter Cell, he knew that his entire history would be erased. Everywhere he had previously worked, every address he had previously lived in, the schools he had gone to as a kid, even the hospital where he was born would all have had their records modified right under the noses of the people who normally maintain those records in order to completely erase literally any evidence that Fisher ever existed in the first place. This meant that it would be impossible for him to get any kind of paid work after leaving Third Echelon, even if he parted with them on amicable terms. The only thing he could do with his own life at that point would be to just aimlessly wander around as a Vagabond like he had presumably been doing in between the events of Double Agent and Conviction because he had literally no identity whatsoever. Now, let's take that understanding of how Protocol 6 works and apply it to the main plot of Conviction. If the President gets her way and shuts down Third Echelon for any reason, even if that reason may otherwise be totally justified, they are effectively dead. In this case, if Third Echelon gets axed by the President, that means the Splinter Cells get literally axed. They can't simply move on with their lives and get other jobs because their ability to do that was taken from them when they signed up to be Splinter Cells. Now, as I mentioned a moment ago, they all willingly signed up for this, right? Well, not really, no. The Splinter Cells all agreed to the consequences of Protocol 6 if they screwed up. If they failed a mission, if they disobeyed any mission protocol such as not using lethal force, or if their actions were somehow brought into public light, then yes, they agreed that having their entire identities being removed from existence means they are effectively non-existent. However, in the events of conviction, they aren't being protocol sexed because they screwed up in any way. These Splinter Cells have done absolutely nothing wrong. Instead, they are being Protocol 6 simply because Third Echelon isn't justifying its funding anymore. They're like Boxer from George Orwell's novel Animal Farm. In that book, Boxer, who was a horse, was sent to the glue factory to be executed, not as a punishment, but simply because he had outlived his usefulness. The Splinter Cells in Conviction are essentially getting the Boxer treatment. So I ask you, did the Splinter Cells all agree to that? Did they all consent to that? Did they all willingly sign up to be led to the slaughterhouse? Not because they didn't do their jobs right, but just because the President just wanted to kill them all? Until I see some irrefutable evidence to the contrary, I'm going to go with, no, that was not included in their consent. So as you can now see, Tom Reed and his army of Splinter Cells are not usurping the President out of greed. They are not usurping the President out of corruption. 
They aren't looking for power. They aren't looking for money. Their act of treason is motivated by the most basic human need of all. They just want to live. Well, ladies and gentlemen, if you enjoyed this video, please hit that subscribe button for more videos just like it. Also, if you enjoyed my content overall, please consider supporting the channel directly, either with Patreon support or channel memberships. Silver and Gold level members and Patreon supporters are allowed to submit requests for video topics, and Gold members and Patreon supporters are allowed to directly assign me video topics that I am guaranteed to cover. In the meantime, however, I am Acer Thorn, and I will see you guys later. Peace!